morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you here. I want to welcome everybody that's joining us online as well. We're so glad that we can be together in the name of Jesus to worship him, to gather together, to be encouraged, to hear from his word, and to draw near to him because the nearness of God is our good. Let's stand together and we're going to uh, read responsively from uh, a portion of Psalm 65 and um, just take note of, of just the, the vision of all the nations of the earth gathering in the presence of God because his presence is where we find our wholeness. Praise awaits you, our God, in Zion. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you, all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Yes, Lord, would you call forth songs of joy? Would you help us, Lord, in all the cares of this world and all the distractions and all the idols? Lord, would you help us to desire you more than anything else? Amen. I would 
like continue our time together, I want to just invite you to think about your desires. Just even right now, just think about what is it that you want? What is it that you feel? What is it maybe that's filling your thoughts on a, a regular basis? And then just ask yourself, where, where's, where's God and all that? And maybe for some of us, we're, we're seeking God. Um, in a lot of different ways and that different aspects of our lives. And maybe some of us are kind of drifting. And um, the beautiful thing is that God's invitation is to come into his presence. And from the beginning, from the time that he revealed himself to people, he was inviting people into a relationship with him. 
And the more that they drew near to him, the more that they could see his greatness, his goodness, his power, his righteousness, his compassion. And so I just want to invite you to ask the Lord in your hearts to show more of himself to you so that our desires and our affections would be oriented towards him. Not just when we're at church for an hour, but every day that we wake up, that we would know that there's nothing that can take his place, nothing that can satisfy more than him. This Lord, draw us near to yourself.
yourself to Moses and you said, I am. You're the only constant. You are the source of all life. Anything that is good and right and true comes from you. Lord, we just pray that you would help us. Lord, we're so easily distracted. We're so easily entertained. We find too much pleasure in simple things or even in wicked things sometimes, Lord. And we just pray that you, your presence, your truth would overshadow all those things that we have put before you. And you would help us, Lord, to come back to our first love, and that's you. We pray, Lord, that as we discover more of your greatness, that we would be able to proclaim that greatness, to show that greatness in many different ways, Lord, to a world that is lost, to a world that finds its fulfillment in things that cannot truly fill them, that cannot save them. And Lord, we just pray that you would pour more of yourself into us so that we can pour ourselves out for you in this world. Thank you so much. We pray that you would continue to be among us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Christ Church, everyone. My name is John. I'm the pastor here. Christ Church is a strategic partner of Grace Chapel in Lexington on a mission to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and discover God. Hey, if this is your first time connecting with us, whether you're on site here today or whether you're joining us online, we just want to give you a warm welcome. We're so, we're so glad that you could be with us today. Uh, well, the only announcement today is communion. We want to remind you that today is Communion Sunday, so uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, this would be a great time in the service to step out in the foyer and, and take one of our communion cups for those of you who are joining us on site. After the message today, we'll be partaking in communion. And for those of you who are joining us online, now would be a great time to get some water, some crackers, a juice, bread, whatever's available so you could partake with us in the Lord's table later in the service. Well, let's join Grace Chapel as uh, we continue our series, Deep and Wise. One day, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. John the baptizer was there, and as Jesus walked by, John pointed him out to some of his own disciples. Look, the Lamb of God, he said. At that point, a couple of John's disciples fell in behind Jesus and began following at a distance. At a certain point, the Gospel of John tells us, Jesus stopped, turned around, looked them in the eye, and said, what do you want? What a question. What do you want? Now, last week, Mike Hammond from Gordon College uh, talked to us about what he called the most important question of all. Who do you say that I am? Another question Jesus asked his disciples. Well, after getting over the fact that Mike had stolen my introduction for this week, I realized he'd actually set me up beautifully. Because if who do you say I am is the most important question of all, the most provocative and revealing question of all might be, what do you want? It exposes what's going on inside of us, what we're really after, what we want out of life. Now, most of us here today are listening online are, are Jesus followers or Jesus seekers. Suppose Jesus would turn and look you in the eye right now today and say, what do you want? How might you answer? Now, some uh, rather shallow and superficial, maybe not so superficial answers come to mind, but quick ones come to mind. We'd like COVID to go away once and for all. 
We'd like gas prices to drop. We'd like the temperature to drop just a little bit. Red Sox fans want the 2000s back, right? <laughs> But beneath the surface, deeper down, what do we really want as human beings? And a few things pretty quickly come to mind. Happiness for one thing, right? I mean, we want to be happy, we want the people we love to be happy. And I don't mean happy in the shallow sense of the word, I mean deep down joy, contentment, satisfaction. We want that for ourselves and for the people that we love. Well, it turns out happiness is a little harder to come by these days. One polling organization has been surveying uh, Americans since 1972, asking them if they would describe themselves as very happy, pretty happy, or not very happy. And for nearly 50 years, the results have always been the same. The very happy have outnumbered the not too happy by like three to one for almost 50 years until 2021. All that changed. The very happies plummeted to 19%, while the not too happy surged to 24%. Which means that for the first time in polling history, in 50 years, Americans were more likely to say they're not happy than to say they're very happy. And the numbers held across the board、uh, young, old, male, female, Republican, Democrat, healthy and sick. And that's too bad because deep down we, we want joy, contentment, satisfaction for ourselves and the people that we love. We want love, don't we? We want to love. And, and we want to be loved. We, we want to have special people in our lives. We, we want family and friendship and romance and community. We want to belong. It turns out that's a little harder to come by these days as well. I mean, COVID has isolated us from family and friends, it's made us nervous and uncomfortable in places that we always felt comfortable before. Past couple of years, culture and politics have created distance between us and people that we know and love. It's strained family and friendship relationships. It's maybe even distanced us from brothers and sisters in Christ. It's caused some of us to, to walk away from people and places that were once very important to us. So we want happiness, we want love, and, and we want meaning, don't we? We want to, think that, we want to know that our lives matter, that, that we're making a difference in the world. A Lifeway research study tells us that 57% of Americans tell us they wonder about the meaning and purpose of life at least once a month. 21% wonder about it every week, and 20% wonder about it every single day. What's the meaning and purpose of life? And those numbers are all up since a decade or so ago. So we want a lot of things as human beings superficial things and really substantial things. But in the words of an unlikely, Theologian songwriter, you can't always get what you want.、Right? So, what do you do then? And what do you do when you do get what you want, but you still can't get no satisfaction? Same songwriter, theologian. And by the way, if rock and roll is about anything, it's about wanting, right? Wanting more of something. Unfortunately, what, what often happens when we don't get what we want is that we start trying too hard. We, we forget who we are. We, we, we compromise our convictions. We, we go looking for love and meaning and purpose in all the wrong places. And, and we end up either resenting people who have what we, have, what we want, or we end up trying to imitate people who have what we want. And it leads to all matter of disappointment and harm. And, and alienation. So clearly, we need some wisdom for all of this. So, this summer, we're exploring the New Testament book called James. And we're, and we're looking for a faith that's both deep and wise, a faith that can handle the challenges of modern life and offer us a, a way through them to good and beautiful lives. So far, we've talked about wisdom for hard times, wisdom for difficult relationships, wisdom for handling power and wealth. Today, we're going to talk about wisdom for our wants. What do we want really? Where and how should we look for it? How will we know when we've found it? 
Well, we've ended up taking things a little bit out of order as we've kind of made our speaking assignments here in the, in the summer months. So we're kind of jumping into chapter 4 here. Somehow I ended up with James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And I should let you know, it's one of the most hard-hitting and hard-to-interpret passages in the whole book of James and maybe in the whole New Testament. So to try to make a little sense of that, or try to organize our thoughts, we're going to apply a kind of a medical model here as we work our way through the passage. We're going to talk about symptoms, diagnosis, prescription, and prognosis. So to paraphrase the old joke, I'm not a doctor, but sometimes I play one in the pulpit. So just hang with me here, and I think it will all come together in the end. Let's go to the opening verses, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Well, as usual, James doesn't pull any punches, does he? It's pretty clear from these opening verses that something has gone very wrong with these believers and with their church. So let's begin by identifying some of the symptoms here. That's the first thing any good doctor wants to know. So, so let's hold, James holds up that mirror he talked about back in chapter 1 and, and allows them to take a good look at themselves. And it's not a pretty sight. They're fighting with each other, quarreling and arguing, maybe even getting physically violent with each other. Now, most commentators agree that they probably weren't literally killing each other, most likely, James is once again alluding to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, as he often does in this letter of his. We remember Jesus saying, if anyone is angry with a brother or sister, they're guilty of murder. So whatever they were doing to each other, this was an ordinary church conflict kind of stuff. This is serious trouble. Now, what are they fighting about? Well, James doesn't say specifically, but it seems like their wants were out of control. He says, you covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So to covet something is to want something. To want it so badly that you'll do whatever is required to get it. To want it so badly, you might even take it from someone who has it, or at least resent someone who has it, and you don't. And because they were so focused on what they wanted and what others had, they'd completely taken their eyes off the good things that God wanted to give to them. They'd forgotten what James told them back in the first chapter. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. And when they finally did get around to asking God, they asked for all the wrong things, things that really weren't good for them, and they asked in all the wrong ways, selfishly and demandingly. And so after all that striving and all that quarreling and all that, all that coveting, they still ended up with none of the things they really wanted. How'd you like to go to that church? This isn't a bunch of pagans that James is talking about. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. So we like to think we're in better shape than that, and, and hopefully we are. But maybe we should pause and look a little longer into that mirror that James holds up to us here. Are we displaying any of these same symptoms? Have you ever watched someone drive out of the church parking lot in a really nice car and wished it was your car? And maybe resented the fact that uh, you work at least as hard as they do? Have you ever looked at someone else's Instagram post and wished that their life was your life? And maybe made a snarky comment about them to whoever happened to be with you at the time? Have you ever spoken disparagingly about a brother or sister in Christ or walked away from a people or a group because of some political or cultural disagreements? Have you ever wanted something so badly, financially, professionally, romantically, that you just took matters into your own hands instead of trusting God to provide what was best in the moment? When those things start happening, James says, Something has gone wrong with our wants. And if we don't pay attention, these, these out-of-control wants can ruin our relationship with God and each other and rob us of the very things we're looking for, joy and love and meaning. And so the symptoms James identifies for us are greed 
envy, anger, strife, and dissatisfaction. So let's get to the diagnosis. But we better brace ourselves because it's not very good news. Verses 4 and 5. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? The diagnosis, according to Dr. James, is what we call worldliness. It's a good preacher's word, right? Don't you know, he says, that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Now, what, what's that all about? Well, let, let's understand, when the Bible talks about the world, it's not talking about the earth, and it's not talking about the human race. We know from the book of Genesis that the earth God made is good, and that the human race God made is very good. God made this earth and put us here in his image in order that we might enjoy this earth, that we might work it, that we might bring it to its full potential in relationship with him. Worldliness is simply what's left when we leave God out of the picture. When we try to live our lives and run the world and find satisfaction apart from God, the one who made us and put us here. So in the church world that I grew up in, worldliness meant things like going to the movies and gambling and drinking and smoking and short skirts and rock and roll and mowing the lawn on Sundays. When my parents took me to our very first movie as a family, we went to the drive-in so no one from church would see us. <laughs> it's Mary Poppins. Yikes. <laughs> in some church circles in those days, worldliness meant going to a secular university or trusting science or being involved in social causes. Now, thankfully, I think we've got a more reasonable, a more balanced, and I believe a more biblical view of many of these things today, but, but worldliness still shows up in the church today. Maybe in our fascination with celebrity, pastors, musicians, authors, Maybe our pursuit of political power and clout and influence. Maybe in our consumeristic approach to church life. Uh, focusing on comfort and convenience and our preferences. When, whenever church life becomes more about us than about God, we're drifting into worldliness. So worldliness is simply life without God without his blessings. It's, it's money without contentment. It's work without meaning. It's, it's power without justice. It's, it's sex without our souls. It's pleasure without joy. It's abundance without gratitude. It's knowledge without wisdom. Life without God never really satisfies because we've ended up separating ourselves from the very source of all these good things that we really want. And when we do that, when we distance ourselves from God, James tells us, God gets jealous for us. That's a strange word to use to apply to God, but it's the word James uses, and it's a really strong word. There's no getting around it, so we better figure out what he's saying. So I should point out that verse 5 is probably one of the most difficult verses to translate in, in all of Scripture, certainly all of the New Testament. In part because there, is, there are textual variants to the text. We're not sure exactly what the original manuscripts said. And in part because many of the words have multiple meanings. I wrote a 20-page paper on this one verse back in seminary. I'll spare you that because it literally put me to sleep on the couch the other night as I was trying to go through it together. So, <laughs> literally. But I will tell you that I ended up coming to the same translation that our new international version translators have come to in their most recent edition. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us? James seems to be reminding his readers of a concept they would have been very familiar with from the Old Testament, the jealousy of God. Uh, verses like Exodus 34, 14. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord your God, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. 
Again, that feels like a strange way to talk about God. We usually associate the word jealousy with all kinds of negative connotations, with a love that's, that's controlling and, and, and possessive and, and suspicious. And that kind of jealousy is certainly unloving and unworthy of God. But the jealousy being described here is simply an intense and all-encompassing desire for and delight in another person. An intense and all-encompassing desire for and delight in another person. God longs for us the way a lover belong, longs for their beloved. And what God longs for is our real selves, our true selves. That's what James means by the spirit or the soul that God caused to live within us. God wants to know and be known by us in the deepest possible way. He wants, he wants to share all of life's experiences with us. He wants us to share our real selves fully and wholly and freely with him. Isn't that what any loving wife or husband wants from their spouse? Isn't that what any good friend wants from their good friend? Sharing all of life, being our true selves with each other. Now, that doesn't mean there's no room for other loves or other delights in the beloved's life. Of course there are. And a loving God, like a loving spouse or a loving friend, wants the beloved one to experience all the fullness of all these other things but to experience those things in a way that deepens their relationship with each other, that brings them closer together. Food, drink, work, play, family, friendship, adventure, art, entertainment, leisure, laughter. These good gifts were given to us to enjoy by and with a good God. But when these other loves and delights begin to distract or detract, from our love and delight in the one who gave them, something has gone wrong. When we want the gifts but not the giver, something's gone wrong with our wants. And so our jealous God reaches out in love to call and bring us back into a relationship through which all those good things actually flow. The commentator puts it this way. God desires with all of his heart for us to come home and to live with him and in him and to ask for his wisdom. That's why every attempt to satisfy our wants apart from and outside of our relationship with God always come up short. But when we leave God out of our, of our finances, of our family life, of our friendship, of our careers, of our hobbies, of our sexuality, of our entertainment, they never really satisfy the way they were intended to because they were meant to be pursued and enjoyed in relationship with the God who gave them to us in the first place. When, when I give my grandkids a, a football or a coloring book or a, a board game, I don't want them to run off in the room and play it without me. I want them to play with me. I want to spend time with them. I want to get closer to them. I want us to know each other and share life and that gift together. So it is with our God. So before we rush to James' prescription for all of this, let's just pause for a minute and ask ourselves, is there anything in our lives that God might be jealous of in a loving way? Anything that might be distracting or detracting from our relationship with him. Are there activities, pursuits, relationships that we've left God out of that we're not pursuing together? I, I don't know about you, but I'm surprised sometimes at how easy it is to fall into this. Even after a lifetime of walking with a good God who has blessed me in all kinds of ways I could never have imagined, but how easy it is sometimes to make plans, to make a decision, to spend money, to take a trip, to do my job, to re relate to a person without inviting God into the equation. When that happens, James says, when we start doing life without God, it calls for a swift and immediate response. And that's what he's going to describe in the next section. So let's jump down to verses 7 through 10 and get to James' prescription for worldliness. Now I should warn you, it's strong medicine, but it works. 
Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Our, our team was talking through, reading through these verses earlier in the week as we prepared for the, the service and the message, and, and one of our worship leaders made the observation about James' lack of diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. This isn't the kind of bedside manner we want from our physicians. His prescription, in a word, is repentance. Now, we know what repentance means. It means turning around, turning away from life without God and turning towards God. God. Just so there's no doubt about it, James gives us a very clear and detailed prescription. He's going to give us 10 commands here. Let's walk through them quickly. You can count them as we go. One, submit to God. Have you been resisting God's love and leading in some aspect of your life? Get on your knees, James says. Name the resistance and surrender it to God all over again. Number two, resist the devil. Has Satan been sitting on your shoulder whispering lies or accusations in your ear? Flick him away, James says, and start listening to God. The other night I stepped out onto the back deck, as I often do, at the end of a kind of a long day. Stood in the dark for a moment or two, and, 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 and I sensed the enemy messing with my head and my heart getting me to think things that weren't helpful to me or to people that I love. And I almost just gave into it and went there. But I thought about this verse, and I literally said out loud, get out of here, Satan! Turned and happily walked back inside and went to bed in partnership with God. Sometimes you just have to do that. Number three, come near to God. James is describing a worshiper eagerly approaching the temple to... to to straighten out his relationship or her relationship with God. Have you been drifting from God, consciously or unconsciously? Turn around right now, James says. Make a beeline back, back to worship, back to prayer, back to scripture, back to service, back to whatever it is God's calling you to. Number four, wash your hands. Is there some ugly unholy habit or behavior that, that you've been hanging on to. Get some spiritual soap and water, James says, and wash your hands of it. That might mean telling a friend about it. It might mean canceling some subscription. It might mean pouring something down the drain. It might mean deleting something from your computer. It might mean naming a problem and finally getting some help with it. Five, purify your hearts. Are you harboring some ugly hurtful habit or attitude in your heart. Get the broom out, James says. Sweep it away and invite the Holy Spirit to come fill that space. Grieve, mourn, and wail. That's six, seven, and eight if you're counting. Have you grown callous to the things that break God's heart? Are you unmoved? Are we unmoved by the pain that other people are experiencing? It's time to start weeping, James says, over the evil in the world and maybe over the brokenness in our own hearts and how we've contributed to it. Nine, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Have you been distracting yourself from things that really matter, amusing yourself to oblivion? It's time to get serious and do something, James says, with your one and only life. Number 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. Are you feeling pretty good about yourself compared to everybody else in the world? Well, maybe it's time to fall on your face and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Do whatever it takes, James is saying, to restore and renew your life with God. That's what you do if your marriage was in trouble. If a friendship was floundering, if your child were wandering and drifting, you would do whatever it took to, to restore that relationship, to get it back on track in the bounds of love. I think it's safe to say that COVID and all we've been through the past couple of years 
has knocked many of us out of our normal rhythms and practices for nurturing our relationship with God. And along the way, we found all kinds of reasons and excuses, perhaps, for distancing ourselves from people and places and practices that once were a normal part of our lives. Don't waste another day, James says, distancing yourself from God and his good gifts. Do whatever it takes to, 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 to find your way back. Maybe it's time to reclaim your daily time with God. Maybe it's time to re-engage with your church, online or in person or both. Maybe it's time to reconnect with your small group or to find another one. Maybe it's time to start serving again in the church or in the world, wherever God calls you. Almost every week this summer, as I've been here or visiting around other campuses or connecting with people online in the middle of the week, almost every week someone comes to me and says, I'm back! <laughs> the first time for some in person in, in two and a half years. And they've got a great big smile on their face. And it brings a smile to my face. And I think it brings a smile to God's face. Because he's jealous for our love, for our engagement with him and with his people and with his work in the world. Wisdom tells us to do whatever it takes to restore or renew our life with God. Speaking of rock and roll and wanting more, when I wrote that phrase, whatever it takes, earlier in the week, it brought to my mind a pretty good song by Imagine Dragons from a few years ago. I think James would have liked the song. It's got this driving, intense urgency to it. Whatever it takes, the chorus goes, because I love the adrenaline in my veins. Whatever it takes, because I love how it feels when, it, when I break the chains. Whatever it takes, yeah, take me to the top. I'm ready for whatever it takes. The songwriter wants more, more out of life, more fullness, more freedom, more joy, more significance, and that's good because God made us for those things and for more of those things. The only thing I would say to the songwriter is don't leave God out of the music. Don't leave God out of the picture because he wants those things for you as well and they're best and most fully found in relationship with him. So it turns out a lot had gone wrong for the believers and their church and maybe for us too. The symptoms, dissatisfaction. The diagnosis, worldliness, doing life without God. The prescription, repentance, turning back to God. So what's the prognosis? Is there any hope for, for these believers and for us? As it turns out, the prognosis is actually pretty good. <laughs> Listen to what we can expect if we'll follow James' prescription here. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And the best news, we had, best verse we actually skipped over back in verse 6. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. You want more of something? How about more grace? How about more goodness? How about more kindness? How about more favor? How about more forgiveness? How about more freedom? Turns out God is so jealous for you. All you have to do is take a step in his direction and he takes two steps towards you. Maybe three, maybe four. In fact, God is so jealous for you if you just turn in his direction from a far country like that prodigal son, just sort of turn in his direction, he will come running to you, bringing with him all the things that you fully and freely wanted in the first place. Joy, love, meaning. And that's the prognosis as it turns out. Overwhelming joy, perfect love, ultimate meaning. Joy is happiness that transcends our circumstances. Love that's unconditional and irreversible. Meaning, no matter what life brings our way. Because God is jealous for us. God is with us. He's already demonstrated his readiness to do whatever it takes to bring us back to him, including sending his own son to find us and bring us home. So at the beginning of the message, I ask you, if Jesus would turn and look in your direction and ask, what do you want? 
How about you answer? What are you wanting out of life right now? If it's something good and true and beautiful, you can and will find it in relationship with the God who offered it to you in the first place. So may you and I and we do whatever it takes to renew and restore our life with God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this incredible, almost irresistible, jealous love that you want us so much that by your spirit you prompted us to be here today, to be in your presence and to be with each other. So thank you for that love and your faithfulness to us. Forgive us, Lord, for our wandering, for our distraction, for our laziness, for our foolishness, and even occasionally for our stubbornness and rebellion. Help us, Lord, to do whatever you're inviting us to do today, this week, this summer, this fall, to find our way back to fullness of life with you and with your people. Lord, as we come now to the communion table, as we draw near to you here, we ask that you might draw near to us for your glory, for our joy, and for the good of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, that's quite a list. Resist the devil, humble ourselves, mourn. As we reflect a little bit on James chapter 4, it seems like God's standard is way up here. And, and for those of you who have walked this journey with Jesus for any amount of time, you've, you've had times or seasons where you have felt like you have been way down here. The truth is, when we just simply turn to God, God doesn't ask us to meet him halfway. He goes all the way, all the way down. And that's what this communion table is about. It's about a promise. It's about the promise of God to us that we can experience life, joy, peace, meaning. Even as sinners who often feel hopelessly lost, we can experience life in him because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the new covenant, the new promise that he gives us. So by way of reminder, this is not the table of Christ's church of Amherst. This is the Lord's table. So if at any time in your life you've made a decision to follow Jesus, to give your heart to Jesus, we invite you to partake. And this, this very act that, that churches all over the world are participating in today and have for centuries. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And he said, this, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this. Do this in remembrance of me. same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread or you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that as Christians all over the world repeat these words, partake in this meal today, we, we come together in solidarity with the belief, and not only that you have given us provision to 
enter into a holy and perfect relationship with God, but you have a promise for something better. You have a promise that when you return, Lord, that life will be made whole. Thank you, Lord, that we can experience some of that wholeness in our hearts, even today, even right now. In Jesus' name. stand together. So what do you want? Or better yet, what desires do you want to have? 
James chapter 4 is one of my favorite sections in Scripture because it refuses to let me live on the surface. It, it, every time I read it, it, it challenges me deeper on the inside, and, and it goes right to the heart of the matter. It, it turns out that, that some of the problems that we face in the world, some of the conflicts that we have between each other, aren't just matters of, of other people's actions. They aren't just matters of our actions or the circumstances that are going around us. They are matters of the heart. And we serve a divine surgeon who can enter into that space and bring wholeness and transformation when we yield and when we submit to him. Well, it's great to be with you here at Christ Church. What an opportunity to worship the Lord, to, to strive to serve him and become more like him today. As we close our service, we want to invite you, uh, first of all, to join us for refreshments after service for all who are joining us. And if this is your first time joining us today, we encourage you to fill out one of our, our Connect cards. And this is just a chance for us to get to know you. We want to send you a small gift. Is our way of saying hello. And, and for those of you joining us online, we have a way for you to do that as well. For those of you who consider Christ Church to be your home, we want to give you the opportunity to give. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, and we have a couple ways that you can do that as well. And may, the, may the God who entered into our hearts through the Holy Spirit help us to become more like him, help us to experience the joy and peace that comes from the transformation of the heart. Have a great week.